All right, good morning. We're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Mary Leonard. I'm chair of the Department of Pediatrics and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Pediatric Grand Rounds. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Kari Nado join us today. And as always, I wanna extend uh, my thanks and my gratitude to the Pediatric Grand Rounds Committee for the really timely presentations that they've been bringing and the very distinguished speakers they've been bringing to us every week. So we'll take care of a few announcements, but first I wanna make sure everybody remembers that um, the CME credit is through the text code um, and the numbers attached here to confirm your attendance. And we will put that in the chat for your convenience to claim your CME credit online. Next slide, please. Um, and again, the Pediatric Grand Rounds Committee has been very mindful of diversity and and, rec and so uh, and health equity, of those sorts of issues. And so next week, we're uh, so fortunate to hear from Jean Chia in recognition of Disability Awareness Month. And we're going to hear about care coordination for children with medical complexity. Next slide. Um, and then the week after that, um, we're going to hear about development, implementation, and outcomes of clinical pathways building on experience from acute kidney injury in heart transplantation, you hear from Seth and Claudia who are really thought leaders in things like target-based care and quality improvement, clinical effectiveness. Next slide. And then we're gonna have our fourth annual Stanford Maternal and Child Health Research Institute Symposium. And we've been so fortunate every year to just bring the most extraordinary keynote speakers. And this year is no exception where Kelly Moley will be joining us the Deputy Director of Reproductive Health Technologies for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And then the different sessions will highlight many of the MCHRI in, uh, funded investigators. And you can see some of the topics here. Um, importantly, uh, newer this year and last year and this year are scientific advances in diversity, health equity, and social justice. Next slide. And then as many of you know, the Dunleavies gave us a quite extraordinary and truly transformative gift in maternal and fetal medicine. So we're going to be starting with the center event on fetal therapy. So please join us for that on November 9th. And you can see, and this is obviously in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Next slide. All right, with that, I'm gonna uh, pass the baton to Dave, uh, Dr. David Lewis, who is our chief of allergy immunology and rheumatology. And, himself has done some very distinguished science in the last year or two on COVID. Um, but with David, you'll introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. It's really with great pleasure I introduce uh, Karin Nadeau for uh, today's Pediatric Grand Rounds. Uh, she's uh, the director of the Sean N. Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research, um, a professor of uh, medicine, pediatrics, ENT, and I'm probably missing a few, epidemiology, I think, and um, has really been a uh, world leader in uh, research related uh, to allergy, uh, food allergy, and just general mechanisms of disease, and more recently has done some very important work uh, related uh, to uh, COVID-19 uh, at Stanford. Uh, with uh, actual uh, patient related studies that have been really, I think, uh, heroic in their scale, uh, involved a lot of uh, people, but have been really, I, I think, important. And more recently, um, she has um, been increasingly interested in uh, areas related to uh, the environmental impact on uh, disease in children and uh, pregnant women in particular, uh, among other things, uh, the impact on uh, allergic disease, asthma. And I think this really goes back to her time uh, uh, in the old days when she was focused really on uh, uh, children in Fresno with asthma. I think that's kind of where some of this, this interest uh, uh, really started and it's just really grown and it's, it's really fabulous that she's now uh, engaged on a global scale with the WHO in pursuing some of these, these uh, issues. Uh, they're important for um, medicine and public health. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kari. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me, Dave. It's been wonderful to work together. I wouldn't be here without you. And Mary, thank you for the introduction as well. So excited to be here uh, and to be able to present on in pediatrics. So 
I will talk today about wildfires and climate change and their effect on children and uh, pregnancy. What you're seeing here is wildfire smoke in, so in someone's pharynx. So I wanted to show you the extent to which the particulate matter can get into our bodies and affect our bodies. So this is up close and personal. Uh, my disclosures are here and you can read them in my slides for Grand Rounds. So the outline today I'll speak about are why are wildfires increasing? What is actually in wildfire smoke? What levels of wildfire smoke do we get exposed to? Short-term and long-term health consequences are present, especially in children and pregnancy. And then most importantly is how can we study these effects in Stanford at all of our wonderful collaborations between pediatrics and other institutions at Stanford. And then importantly, as physicians and as pediatricians and as healthcare workers, how can we mitigate harm? How can we move forward as advocates and activists to help in climate change and wildfires? And then I'll leave room for questions and discussions. So importantly is that we used to actually have a wildfire season here in California, and that's no longer the case globally. There are no boundaries. These wildfires are existing all throughout the world because of the heat rise around our planet, especially in the tipping point of the Arctic. You can see here different examples of the scope of wildfires, including Brazil, Kenya. In Indonesia, the peat moss is uh, getting burned because they're clearing many of the forests. And of course, we also have heard about our colleagues in Australia with the wildfires there. And so importantly, is that these trends are increasing. You can see the red and the blue zones, most of these areas in the red zone, and you can see California there are close to us, and we should really make sure we understand how this affects health on the public level and the individual level. So the other problem, though, is that when wildfires occur and the green gas emission is enhanced, that actually leads to more warming of the planet. So wildfires themselves feed into the vicious cycle of warming our planet and increasing effects of climate change, thereby causing more drought, thereby causing more wildfires. And so you can see in this really great New England Journal review that was published in October 2020, some of the predicted models, if we don't reduce temperatures around the globe, if we don't reduce fossil fuel emissions, what we should expect to see in terms of wildfires and change in temperatures around the globe. And when you look at the overall trends, you can see from 1980 to let's say what's extrapolated into 2025, that people expect to see increase in acreage burned. We certainly have seen that here in California. It's increasing across the West, but also in many other places. What I also wanna point out is, I think we are obviously doing a much better job now, thanks to preparedness plans around our state and around the West. But even just a few year, years ago, about three years ago, for example, we didn't have an emergency preparedness plan. This is the hospital in Paradise, California, for example. A lot of you will remember that horrible fire and no one had any place to go to. This was supposed to be the safe house that people would evacuate to from their own homes to have clean air. And the hospital is one of the first places, unfortunately, to burn down. The other issue are vulnerable populations, which we'll talk about today, that are the target for a lot of wildfire exposures. And you can see here this little girl, she's wearing a mask that doesn't quite fit her. It's really doing no good. And we'll talk about that today in terms of mitigating the risks of wildfires. What things can people wear? What things can our patients wear to really decrease exposure? And she's outside. Um, in addition, children are at higher risk for the effects of wildfire. And we'll talk about that today. What are some of the causes? Well, unfortunately, as the globe heats up, as drought increases across uh, the globe and uh, with increased temperature, then the fuel itself, i.e. the trees, other areas and plants, those increase in temperature. And so they're more likely to burn at the small evidence of a spark. And with that, unfortunately, most of these sparks are man-made or man-attributed and many are preventable. So this was a uh, publication from the California Fire uh, Department. And you can see here, lightning is just a small percentage of causing wildfires, whereas debris burning, vehicular um, activation along the highway, and then um, a lot of other activities due to man uh, increases the risk of these wildfires. So what's happening in California? Well, this was a great um, data set that you can see from 1932 
to 2021, the gradation of heat here. And we used to say every year that this is yet another record-breaking wildfire. But now, over the past three years, uh, I think we really should be aware of the fact that this is becoming a broken record. So I call it broken record, record-breaking wildfires, and they're expected to increase every year. And so now's our time to act and to make sure that we practice prevention for our patients and the world. And I think before we move forward as, as healthcare workers, it's really helpful to know what's actually in wildfire smoke. What are people getting exposed to? And unfortunately, it's just not wild anymore. Our colleagues at the Woods Institute, Noah Diffenbaugh and others, have actually shown that about 50% of what we would consider wildfires is actually commercial and residential burning as well. And so unfortunately, because of land use and because people are moving more and more towards the edges of the forest, you see that most of these wildfires are also burning people's homes and commercial areas. So it's more than just burnt trees in the atmosphere. There's polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. There's your Drano underneath the sink. There's your favorite shampoo going up in the air. And then unfortunately, the soot balls, which you're seeing there over on the right, those can actually lay on top of the atmosphere and cause even more warming um, and less wind. And we saw that um, here in the Bay Area over the last two years with our, the soot and the smoke from the, our wildfires nearby. The secondary air pollutants are particulate matter and ozone. As, as that uh, organic material floats up into the air, both horizontal and vertical plumes of smoke with the sunshine that we have in California that actually through the ultraviolet rays and the heat increases the ozone uh, reactants within a chemical um, product. And that's a problem too for our lungs and especially for children and pregnant women. And unfortunately, when vehicles and buildings burn, you also are seeing other heavy metals, microplastics, toluene, styrene. So these are all things that are in the air and they don't come down until it rains or the wind brings it elsewhere. And unfortunately, the people that are at the highest risk for some of these wildfire exposures are the firefighters. And we'll talk about that as well. So what levels of wildfire smoke do we get exposed to? Even hundreds of miles away, you can see here that the wildfires, for example, this past July in Lake Tahoe and other places spread across the country very quickly. So um, I'm from the East Coast, my friends in the East Coast told me about the smoke before I saw it here in San Francisco because the wind was blowing east. So smoke circumnavigates, it sees no boundaries, and unfortunately there's no safe distance from wildfire smoke. And it's important to look at these gradations that I know a lot of you probably have this app on your phone. But when we talk about air quality indices, this was something that a group put together and presented these codes. However, they really haven't been strenuously tested or rigorously assessed. And the EPA has uh, a great website there that I wanted to share with you as well as the American Lung Association. But importantly, these air quality indices reflect particulate matter alone. They don't reflect other toxins in the air. They don't reflect volatile organic compounds. And so we still need to understand to what extent the smoke can affect health both acutely and chronically. But be careful and beware. I usually tell my patients, once you get into the yellow zone, stay inside and stay in a filtered area if you can. And you'll see here the purple zone. It was originally graded, graded as 201 to 300. And unfortunately, now we've seen wildfires that transmit even higher than 300. So we probably have to change the scale very soon. So, Short-term and long-term health consequences. This is really important. And this is where I wanna spend a lot of time. This is where we can help out as healthcare practitioners. And my colleague, Jonathan Potts has a great review in which we need to put all of our care that we present to patients in the context of climate change, in the context of the overall holistic approach to their health, social determinants of health, health equity is very important. And importantly, there are a lot of different effects of climate change. So any one individual person is being affected by all these things at once. Today, we're talking about wildfires, but it is an air pollutant. It increases allergens in the air. You also deal with heat-related illnesses and death, unfortunately, both in children, pregnant women, and, um, and adults. 
There's severe weather issues, loss of homes, mental health impacts, environmental degradations with forced migrations and displacement, which can lead to much stress and mental health impacts. In fact, the first thing you see within some of the population health work that Melissa Bondi and her group are doing now across the wildfire areas is uh, psychological uh, admissions to the hospital. It is really causing a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder. Importantly is that environmental justice is key in climate change. We need to protect and advocate for children and for those most vulnerable people of color, as well as pregnant women. There's a lot of changes in vector ecology. Our colleague Desiree LeBeau and others here um, are looking at these shifts across the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn in terms of the emission of vectors and climate change. There's issues with water and food supply in, impacts and food security. And then of course, the quality for example, in the Central Valley, which is very dry, uh, the uh, increase in coccidia of mycosis are quite dramatic now in terms of infections. So this is just another depiction of what uh, your body goes through when wildfires are, are in the air. And even hundreds of miles away, thousands of miles away, you can still see these effects. And you don't necessarily have to see it or smell it or be irritated by it or get a little throat itching. You don't have to have any symptoms. It can still affect you, unfortunately. So what you can't see or smell could actually harm you. And you can see that the first layer that gets into our bronchi and in the physiology of our lungs down into the small areas of the alveoli, that passes particulate matter less than 2.5 microns. It's really even smaller than a diameter of your hair. But unfortunately, with wildfire smoke, you have, and many groups are at greater risk of wildfires. So the underserved have less access. People with heart or lung disease are more vulnerable to particulate pollution. Older adults are at considerable risk and children are at significant risk because of possible acute as well as chronic exposure. We need to understand this more. They breathe more air per pound of body weight than adults and their bodies are still developing, especially their lungs. And pregnant women are also at higher risk. And what does this mean? It means we really need to be able to help and understand children and pregnant women and how they're affected. It also means that we need to focus on environmental justice issues to help all people, especially vulnerable people. There are no boundaries when it comes to being affected in terms of socioeconomic status. When wildfires spread, they spread at one football field a second when the wildfires are intense. But unfortunately, those vulnerable populations, those people of color, those people that don't have access to healthcare, they are the most affected after a wildfire because they can't get access to healthcare. They don't necessarily have the evacuation procedures. In fact, California just translated evacuation procedures into other languages outside of English. So we're getting there, but I think for those of you interested, this is really an area of high admit need where we need to focus on how to help people. Evacuation is tough, getting to a clean room is tough, being able to provide communities a place that's cool and clean is something that we would love to be able to do to help our communities. So what happens uh, with children's health and pregnancy? It is important to know that there are in utero effects already. There's a group at Stanford, um, and thanks to our collaboration with OBGYN and with pediatrics, we're trying to understand more about the in utero effects, Marshall Burke, um, and Gary Shaw and others through the Woods Institute are also studying premature births and death rates, unfortunately, due to wildfires. And then, unfortunately, there's neurodevelopment disorders, cognitive defects due to a lot of issues around, uh, around wildfire exposure, as well as climate change. And children in climate change are targeted, unfortunately, and because of extreme poverty and because of 20% of the world's children being in extreme poverty, the further compromise of their social status and access to care increases the risk of premature deaths, for example, about 7 million per year. And so we really feel that even though children are the least responsible for climate change and wildfires, they bear the greatest burden of its impact. So let's talk a little bit further into the short-term issues and acute issues around wildfire exposure versus long-term issues. So short term is defined as one day to less than a month where people are exposed to wildfires. All cause mortality and many organ specific outcomes are positively associated with wildfire exposure. 
We've mapped this out at Stanford as well as many other researchers around the world. I want to show you some examples though. For example, the Caldor fire in 2021 just recently burned 60 days with over 15 days of air quality indices greater than 350 in South Lake Tahoe. And that was 30 miles distance from the fire. So it was very intense. People unfortunately weren't protected even inside their homes, even with the best of filters. The Indonesia fires, which are unfortunately being done to clear the rainforest there, um, they are burning peat moss and forest, forest and typically 30 days out of 100 plus AQI will be in Singapore. And that's 710 miles distance from the fire. And asthma increases uh, during these short-term effects, less than a month, for example. Even after four days, you can see increases in asthma across populations by about fourfold. And it depends on age, but children under the age of four years old are at the highest risk for asthma. Not only asthma exacerbations, but actually induction of asthma. Heart attacks also in older individuals are increased in the ER and hospital admissions increased by about 40%, cardiovascular effects and stroke are also seen um, now repeatedly after wildfire exposure, even after two to three days of wildfire smoke. What about the long-term effects? Well, luckily we were just um, granted an award called the Air Health Program Project Grant at Stanford, where we're working across pediatrics and uh, adult medicine to be able to study the long-term effects of wildfire exposure in the Central Valley and in uh, children and populations that are underserved as well as um, in other areas around the country. And long-term exposure is happening more and more. For example, in Central Valley, approximately 60 days per year are wildfire smoke days. That's increased by over 225%. And then the children are unfortunately exposed to air quality indices of 100 plus. That's in that yellow orange zone that I showed you before. And for example, in the Brazilian Rainforest, 2,000 miles away in Sao Paulo, they are seeing air quality indices of about 200 plus uh, for approximately 240 days of the year. So it's important as we think about these variables, what we should do to try to take care of our patients. For those at the highest risk of chronic exposure, which include the, the firefighters, um, the average firefighter lifespan outside of uh, other variables, i.e. due to the, the risk of their job, they have a 10 years less lifespan than other groups. So this data was actually um, published by our colleagues in PNAS this past year, Marshall Burke. Uh, it works at the Woods Institute with Michael Wara there. And what's I think really important is to look at during pregnancy, the smoke related days and the smoke PM 2.5 intensity due to wildfires and you can see the different attributions in different trimesters of um, pregnancy and how that affects the preterm birth risk per smoke day. So these are quite substantial. And this was published again in PNAS this past year. And importantly is to map this with trimesters, but importantly is pregnant women are at risk uh, and preterm birth occurs with wildfire exposure. What about asthma? I told you about the fourfold increase in children. Even after four days, you're seeing here, um, this was a study that was published by our Berkeley uh, colleagues in public health, and 12.7 um, million uh, people were assessed and hospital visits were examined. And of that, you can see, even, this is back in 2008, the PM 2.5 is on the y-axis, on the x-axis is the months per year. During that year, particularly, there was a wildfire, um, and you can see the increase in PM 2.5, and unfortunately, that led to an increase in asthma risk just due to small changes in 2.5 up to 80. And I told you a little bit about the importance of people that are under-resourced and, under and underserved, and this is a paper that was done on adults, but it's an important example of the fact that uh, unfortunately, the smoke density, women are at higher risk as well uh, for uh, cardiovascular events. And uh, unfortunately, the elderly are as well. And you can see with low, lower socioeconomic status, that increases your risks of cardiac arrest and wildfire-related particulate matter health effects. So again, very important to make sure that we think about health equity 
and how to uh, provide our patients the um, appropriate materials to help in fighting um, any exposures to wildfires, as well as dealing with any illnesses associated with wildfires as well. Here's the example of firefighters. And this was a publication that came out of uh, UC Berkeley Public Health School as well, and our colleagues that we work with there. And you can see that this exposure chronically to wildfire smoke increases the risk of lung cancer and cardiovascular disease. You can see the cardiovascular disease in the yellow here, even after short or long seasons of wildfire. And again, lung cancer risk increases. And we're doing research on this now, but we really want to understand how this starts early, potentially in children, especially that are in areas of the country that have long-term exposures. So how are we further studying this at Stanford? How can we as healthcare workers mitigate harm? Well, I was telling you about Fresno and Dave had mentioned that in his introduction for almost now uh, 15 years, uh, thanks to a, a program project grant that we initially got here in pediatrics with Gary Shaw, as well as with others at University of California, Berkeley, we had been studying for a long time the asthma risks and immune changes in this corridor of the Central Valley around Fresno, uh, around I-5, that unfortunately was exposed to a lot of diesel pollution. And so we were tracking pregnant women, uh, newborns, as well as people up to the age of 25 for longitudinal analysis over their lifespan for exposures of diesel exhaust pollution. But then we realized pretty quickly that when we were examining our individual estimate exposures due to different EPA sites around Fresno, we were seeing that the wind was blowing in wildfires because Fresno is surrounded by a highway on one side and beautiful trees and national parks on the other. And unfortunately in 2015, for example, we were able to map those exposures from wildfires versus those exposures to air pollution because we have individual estimate exposures and we have blood collections and physiological measurements through longitudinal analysis in this population that we've been studying for a long time. And my colleague, Mary Pernicki, and a Stanford undergraduate there Cody, who was pictured, they went down to Fresno and they collected systematically blood as well as asthma measurements. And it's also important to know that some of the ways that we can mitigate wildfires is to clear the forest, clear the forest in a very purposeful way with prescribed burns. And with that, when a prescribed burn happens, oftentimes the public seems to be reticent to uh, have prescribed burns performed in their area because of the potential risk or the theoretical risk that they're worried that it could affect their lungs. And so the California Air Resources Board and the districts within California have been very reticent to have prescribed burns because of this hypothetical risk. And so less and less forests are being cleared out. And unfortunately, then when there's actually a wildfire, the burning is so intense, the heat is so intense that the wildfire gets out of control. You've heard about these wildfire tornadoes that create their own weather patterns. And so we wanted to understand to what degree do prescribed burns affect health versus wildfires? And luckily this population allowed us to do that because we knew when the wildfire prescribed versus prescribed burns occurred in the same group of individuals in, and specifically in children. And so, Thanks to Dr. Pernicki and uh, a team of people from Stanford, they went down and they looked at the different exposures of these criteria air pollutants in the air. And you can see in general uh, from prescribed burns, there's much less than wildfires. And that makes sense. There's much more acreage being burned in a wildfire compared to prescribed burns, but also this allows the California Air Research Board, for example, to then think about making policies so that we can have more prescribed burns carefully and controlled in California. But what happened to the individuals that we collected blood from and that we got physiological measurements on? We looked at 32 that had been exposed to prescribed burns versus 36 in the wildfire. And you can see there already, all, they, a lot did have asthma and the average age was about seven years. And we looked across periods, we controlled for other variables. And for us, because we study immunology, we looked at Th1 cells, which are an important uh, factor in asthma and in fighting infections. And 
what's important there compared to controls that were not exposed to wildfire smoke at all, the people uh, and the children exposed to prescribed burns were more consistently associated with controls compared to wildfires. And this was even after just 90 days of being exposed to prescribed burn versus wildfire. So um, this at least helped the California Air Resources Board be able to help the public as well as themselves be more comfortable with allowing uh, more prescribed burns to occur across the state. We also look at molecular levels of air pollution and wildfire exposure. And this is just an example of where now technology can move us forward. And many of our colleagues in pediatrics are also looking at epigenetic changes. This is a paper that Dr. Panicki and our group published recently to understand each of the different air pollutants within wildfires and how that actually affects our DNA. And this is still being studied, but we do want to understand to what extent these wildfire exposures after chronic exposure year to year to year will permanently affect our DNA or is it reversible? And so these are the studies that are underway currently. Our other uh, collaborations, luckily, uh, we also have been looking at teenagers and uh, their exposure to wildfire smoke and our colleagues in cardiology and the ITI, uh, Dr. Haddad and Dr. Maker and others have been looking at biomarkers that we can test with easily available microsampling in the community to be able to see to what extent they've been individually exposed to wildfires, but also how their body is responding. Uh, because some people might have variable response uh, depending upon their underlying conditions or their underlying exposures or their underlying uh, genetics. But some of the biomarkers that keep coming up over and over again are CRP, IL-18, IL-1 beta, which is uh, common in inflammasome and inflammation. So we're trying to get at easily obtainable biomarkers so that if a policy changes, if uh, prescribed burns or if filters are used, we will then be able to test over time to see to what extent climate change mitigation, climate change adaption, individual and public health policy changes will actually help so that we can measure that and document it. So I'm really excited about this work as well. We talked about the firefighters and they really uh, serve as sort of a, an extreme example, but very important to study for both those uh, service providers that uh, either volunteer or through many hard days of work are exposed to incredible amounts of fire. And you can see there, most of them are wearing bandanas. That's really not enough to decrease the risk of wildfire. And so we're studying active firefighter cohorts uh, as well as a retired firefighter cohort um, to be able to understand the effects of wildfires. So I've talked a lot about the problems, Well, what about the solution? I truly believe that in our research, we should identify problem, do a root cause analysis, but also at the same time, do solution facing research. And with that, it's all about team science and making sure we can have interdisciplinary and multi-age connections to these climate change and wildfire issues. This was the paper uh, that was published in the New England Journal that I mentioned before. And in this paper, they have a great reverse triangle talking about personal actions, which are effective versus least effective. And if people are able, they can relocate. But unfortunately, that is costly. Uh, it induces stress. We, we like living in our homes. We've chosen to live where we live. And leaving that place can cause a lot of stress in families and children. And met, for many families, relocation is not possible. We can close doors and windows. We can set our air conditions and circulation and set up HEPA filters. I'll talk about that in a second. But cost is prohibitive for many. And we saw that in East Palo Alto, for example, people just could not uh, leave their homes. A lot of people have older homes which don't have good filtration. And so the smoke on the outside of the home was almost the same as the smoke on the inside. And when it's so hot outside and people have no air conditions, air conditioning system, it's really hard to be able to have both heat stress and wildfire smoke stress. You can stay indoors and avoid heavy or prolonged physical activity, but unfortunately for a lot of immigrant farm workers, that is not possible. And we still need to be able to protect those people that have to work outside or go to school. And a lot of our schools in California for children are open air. Um, and so we're thinking about how to put those filters into 
uh, elementary schools and high schools around the country, specifically in the West. And then of course, wearing face masks, if you have them up until recently, there was no N95 that really fit children well. I'm glad we now have them, thanks to COVID, thanks to other things. But unfortunately, they don't protect against gaseous pollutants. They do provide a false sense of security and they're not suitable for a lot of people. And the cost is prohibitive for some. Let's just talk a little bit about the face mask. It's really important um, that closing windows or using HEPA filters can help. And that's something that you can talk to your patients about. And N95 masks, as long as they're fitted well, can filter out 95% of particles as small as 0.2 microns, but they need to be fit tested. Uh, their main function of a surgical mask is to protect others from aerosol expelled by its wear, not uh, to decrease the risk of smoke. So people that are wearing typical surgical, surgical masks that I uh, had a photo of that the girl that was outside during a wildfire it's not doing anything to really protect their lungs or protect their blood. Um, and uh, the N95 does protect for fine particulates, but not for carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, and acrolein, which is in typically wildfire smoke. We did a survey, thanks to Eric Smith, who's a student in our center. He's moved on now. He's working at UCLA in medical school. And uh, Dr. Pernicki and others actually asked our healthcare workers, as well as Stanford um, students and other people in the Stanford campus, they provided questionnaires. And you can see there, we had 67 participants. So some of you might have joined the study and for those that did, thank you. But you can see that during the wildfire, and this was about three years ago, um, that there were increases in the frequency of people uh, documenting symptoms of burning eyes, burning throat, fatigue, and headaches. And importantly as well, that over time, previous wildfires, people did not wear a mask and now more and more people are. That was great to see. And now you see that more and more people are wearing N95 masks. So what about air filters? We talked about masks, but what about other things that you can do personally as well as we can um, give guidelines to our patients? So it's important to know that if you're gonna buy a filter that you need to assess a documented parameter called the clean air delivery rate. And the higher the CADR, the more particles the air cleaner can filter and the larger the area it can serve. But most of them really serve a square footage of about 100 square feet to a little bit larger. So basically a, a bedroom. So that's where people cannot assume that if they're just gonna put it into their living room that it's gonna work for their whole house. It does not. So it's very important to understand as well that different filters provide protection against different size particles. So if you buy something called a MERV-8, that's only gonna allow you to decrease mold spores, for example, whereas a MERV-13 is actually going to reduce exposures to burning wood, smog, and even that not to volatile organic compounds. So our colleagues uh, in Utah did this study where you can see that with a HEPA filter, you do see some decreases uh, with exposures to these different particulate matter sizes. And importantly, you're trying to decrease one micron to 2.5 micron sizes because that affects the lungs and can affect the developing lungs, especially in children. And so we are now studying the effects of filters specifically in elementary schools in a randomized controlled study that we're doing in Fresno, uh, thanks to the schools there and the, and the, um, the city council, they're allowing us to study the effect of filters over time in the schools to make sure that we study pre-wildfire, post-wildfire to understand and hopefully see that we can decrease asthma rates in these elementary schools. But if we can start instituting the use of these filters in the classroom, hopefully that will catch on and we can provide resources as well as mitigation circumstances for our families. So what features or certifications should consumers look at? And specifically, if you're giving guide, guidance to your family or your friends or yourself or your patients, make sure that they have these accreditations, um, the California Resources Board, as well as the AHAM. And again, you also want to make sure that gases are removed. And that is possible with some of the filters. So please Ask your patients as well as yourselves to look at the verified AHAM consumer um, materials here that you can look at when you're examining each of the filters that are bought. 
So we actually did an original HEPA filter, um, not, a, in, not in schools, but in people's homes down in Fresno. And we looked at a sham filter versus a filter. Uh, people were blinded and we looked at asthma scores over time. This was done with Mary Pernicki and Lynn Hildeman uh, at the Woods Institute. And you can see compared to the control, the active group did see um, a uh, increase in their ACT scores, so an improvement in their asthma overall. What else can we do to help? It's also important to educate. We need to educate families, educate uh, ourselves, and educate other trainees and residents. We have programs now. The, luckily, the Stanford Medical School has a lot of uh, research going on, but we also have a lot of outreach and education going on in the community, but also the students. And I would um, support anyone that's interested in teaching uh, classes here in the medical school. Lisa Patel, Barbara Ernie, others here at Stanford are doing this. And we've um, come a long way in the last five years. We're really thankful to the medical school for supporting us in that. So this is a document that was put together recently um, in Sonoma in California for patients. And this is available uh, online for those of you interested if you're a patient's ask, you can find this. It's easily printable in terms of how wildfire smoke can affect your health. Now, it's also important to engage the community. And I, I think for a lot of us and for many people looking at the social determinants of health and health equity, that we need to talk to the community as to what they need and what they want. So we went to the high schools in Fresno, asked what they would like us to study what they would like us to help out with. And Dr. Nikki and her team, they found out that it was really making sure that there were filters in the schools. And so that is our next step now. But you can see our children's health and air pollution study, which includes wildfires um, that we do with Berkeley. We're really excited to make sure we engage the community and have an iterative process where we give our data and share our data and discuss it with the community there to help them be engaged and to be inspired by people there. I wanna end with some hope and promise that solutions do uh, have a positive impact. This is a study that was not done through Stanford, but, and this is not necessarily wildfires, but this is an example where due to changes in the EPA um, regulations in 2006 and then 2008 and beyond during the Obama administration and Gina McCarthy's uh, oversight of the EPA, you can see here when uh, ultra low sulfur diesel was used and filters were put in school buses, for example, um, there was a large decrease, significant decrease in the rates of asthma. So this is really a, a great uh, sign that we as pediatricians can do research, we can advocate for our patients, we can advocate for policies. And this was a pediatric group, if I remember correctly, that went to the uh, cities and asked for this study to occur so they could show that a policy change had an effect on children's health. So what's our vision? I think, unfortunately, some of the healthcare uh, institutions around the world have um, emitted a lot of greenhouse gases as well as pollution in the water. And so because of that, I'm really excited that uh, Lucille Packard Hospital is a green hospital and got an award for uh, making sure that it was a sustainable location. And we're working hard at Stanford Healthcare as well. And we need to make sure that Stanford, both LPCH, Stanford Hospital, all the clinics are a leader in sustainability that will generate revenue as well as cost savings. And we can engage trainees, faculty, and staff. There's a new school of sustainability now at Stanford that hopefully we'll get to do a lot of research with. We do need more team research and collaborations across the university, across children and adults. There's a lot of strategic and operational plans. There's more visibility efforts now, and we can engage children and pregnant women in vulnerable populations. And then working locally in the community, as well as at the state and national level and global level, I think will be important. I wanted to share with you some great programs that are already occurring at Stanford in our clinics, thanks to a lot of our faculty that are listed here. There's already an OR green team, reusable isolation gown program, green the clinics project, and then NorCal symposium that was highly attended just two weeks ago. So I think we're so grateful for the interaction between LPCH and Stanford Healthcare to be able to make sure that we can think about 
making sure that our hospitals and clinics are sustained. And I think it's gonna take all of us working together to do research on that. And we've talked about education. We've talked about what we can do to sustain good practices in healthcare. And of course, to be able to truly mitigate and change climate change parameters and global warming, we're gonna to need to look at policy changes and the need to decrease the emission of greenhouse gases and air quality improvement. And so for that we can to advocate for solar, to advocate for other alternative energy and to make sure that we can decrease fossil fuels. And with that, our group um, at Stanford, and this is the same publication that I mentioned before that's looking at preterm births, they actually, at the end of the article, look at some modeling for if we were able to change policy, what would occur? What improvements could be made? Because I think a lot of us, we understand that it's important to get down to 1.5 degrees Celsius for temperature stability, but to what degree? Will that help our patients? And this was a great modeling um, graph that, and this gives me a lot of optimism, that if we can manage climate change, and these are different scenarios here in the, in the aqua, orange, and purple, but importantly, that decrease in PM 2.5, that ability to reduce emissions will result in substantial improvements and decrease in preterm births, for example. This is just preterm births and the um, improvement in healthcare. So we're really excited to be able to model these out. And most importantly, is they're happening around the world already for, for countries that are going completely green, for places that will go completely electric, which includes San Jose, just south of us, we will be able to study this and to what degree changing uh, the use of fossil fuels can be attributed to immediate and long-term health benefits. So in summary, I've talked about wildfire chemical makeup and toxicity levels. We've shown that PM2.5 is associated with inflammation-related respiratory and cardiovascular effects. Climate change increases wildfires, as well as wildfires enhance the effects of global warming. There's more interdisciplinary global research, and it's needed to look at chronic and acute effects of wildfires on the personal and the public health level. Vulnerable populations like children and pregnant women are at risk and the growth of those populations to the edge of the forest is really important to look at and to research on. And that the increases in wildfires likely in the future will occur. There are ways to mitigate and adapt. I'm optimistic that together we can have uh, improvements in individual and public health levels through education, training, emergency preparedness, policy changes, and focusing on the vulnerable populations. And I hope that I've given you some examples today of trying to prevent and manage wildfires and decrease health risks. And um, this is just an example of the cooperation that we're doing across Stanford at the Woods, at the Cardiovascular Institute, through ITI, Department of Medicine, Department of Pediatrics, and the Lane Center for the West. So, I, it's going to take team science to um, really try to get uh, to improve climate change, but also to decrease exposures to wildfire. And I want to thank LPCH Grand Rounds and all of our funders, the Maternal and Child Institute, as well as the Center for Global Health. And um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kari, uh, for that wonderful presentation. Um, uh, we have time for some questions, so I'm just going to uh, read them uh, to you, if that's okay. Sure. So there's a question. Um, with COVID-19, many schools have installed MERV-13 uh, filters. What MERV level would be sufficient for smoke particles? So he's getting very, uh, this person getting very uh, down to technical aspects. If a school didn't upgrade filters, would N95 masks suffice for smoke particles? N99 masks, question mark. <laughs> um, question. Great question. Uh, MERV-13 does typically reduce uh, smoke particles. Again, not gases, but you need, because MERV-13s are, uh, have a higher density of filtration, they get, um, dirty even faster. So you have to replace them, which is important. So you can't just put it in and assume that everything is good. You have to go back and look at the filter, make sure it's not completely brown, because if it is, you got to replace it. 
And then, um, yes, N95 should also help as long as they have a good seal, as long as they're made for children in that school and the appropriate facial um, structure and um, by age, then it will decrease the particulates, but not gases. Um, and, it, and an N99, I have to say, I don't know uh, the exact answer to that. So I'll try to get back to you on that. So the, another follow-up question from the same person is for the home, what filter level would you recommend for uh, brittle asthmatic children? Recommend a MERV 13 um, in the home if you have central air, as well as putting a special filter um, in addition to the MERV 13 in your home in their room. So I would have both. And then I would be really careful if that child is a brittle asthmatic or any child to that uh, matter to make sure that they don't spend a lot of days outdoors um, with uh, any wildfire smoke. Okay, uh, great. The, uh, Ed Leibowitz has uh, two questions. The AQI confuses me because higher numbers are often associated with clear days and brown hazy days are often associated with low AQI numbers. Can you explain this paradox? Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. You know, PM 2.5, you don't necessarily see. Um, so um, typically AQI is a reflection of PM 2.5. And uh, with that, oftentimes when you have high PM 2.5, you also have soot. You also have other particles in the air that you can see. So that's why you assume that any smoky day, you'll also have high PM 2.5. Um, but it isn't necessarily the case. If you can't see it or smell it, it can still be a bad air quality index day. Um, and that is occurring throughout the world. Uh, then he follows up with, what is the relative risk of cigarette smoking uh, and secondhand cigarette smoking uh, compared to wildlife, wildfire pollution? Is there an index that relates wildfire exposure to the number of cigarettes smoked? Ah, excellent question. I'm going to that slide so everyone can see it. So yes, people have actually looked at the equivalence of smoking uh, to eight hours exposure to wildfire smoke outside. And, um, and here it is. So 100 AQI, um, is equivalent to 35 uh, particulate matter, 2.5 micrograms per meters cubed, just if people are interested. But importantly, 22 AQI is like smoking one cigarette. So being outside in 22 AQI, which is kind of typical for the Bay Area for eight hours is equivalent to smoking one cigarette. So I hope that helps answer your question. So for example, if you're in South Lake Tahoe during the Calder fire and it was 350 plus, uh, that was smoking many cigarettes per day, unfortunately. Over yeah, you know, I wonder fire. during the Paradise fire when we had the worst air quality in the world for about more than a week straight, most counties in uh, the Bay Area, you know, what that would be the equivalent to per day, I have no idea. But. Yeah, exactly. So we can make these equivalents, uh, but each person is different as well. Uh, so I, I think we we are always humble in the fact that we don't want people to smoke, uh, but then um, additional issues around wildfire and the smoke in the wildfire is oftentimes much more toxic than air pollution and even tobacco smoke. So I think we still need to do research here, but at least this tries to answer the question about the equivalents. Okay, then there's a question from uh, an attendee. There appears to be a great deal of data. Why can't they link military burn pits to cancers and soldiers and provide them benefits? Um, any studies on how these affect the locals, especially given that many of these younger Afghani people are now refugees in the US? That is really, an excellent question and very packed. And I wish I had the time in another whole grand rounds to talk about the issues that military and other 
refugees are exposed to in terms of wildfires and smoke or around the world. So I, I think it's an excellent question. I agree. I wish more research could be done on this. I hope that people do. I, I, I'm not aware of any research going on at Stanford, for example, on this subject, but I, I do think you're alluding to uh, a question that is on the mind of many people after, um, after a lot of uh, the Gulf War and after a lot of burning. I think John Stewart just did a segment on his new mm -hmm. Apple TV show on this. So I, I think there's something there and I hope someone will pick up the torch literally and figuratively and study this. So uh, Lisa Chamberlain wants to thank you for your amazing CBPR and transdisciplinary work and uh, ask, are there any examples of folks doing work to reach underserved uh, children as, as far as mask fitting, distribution, education, uh, using primary care? Thank you, Lisa, for asking that question. I would love to get more involved in that. We're involved right now in Oakland and Fresno to talk more. Uh, we wanna work with the homeless populations um, as well because they're at the highest risk for homeless families, not being able to get their masks fitted, not being able to have masks, period, not be able to understand that this is something they need to worry about because of a lot of the homeless are outside for long periods of time. So anyone that's interested, I think this would be great to work together with primary care. And, um, and make sure that we can help our communities. So it's a, that would be a wonderful project. Um, David Axelrod thanks you for the presentation and says, I'm engaging my community Menlo Park to address the use of gas powered leaf blowers and similar tools. It's a complicated issue, but I think important for air quality. Any thoughts on this, on what other communities are doing and what we ourselves are doing at Stanford to not pollute our campus air. Oh, I could not agree more. I see those leaf blowers and the, the amount of pollution that any one leaf blower uh, gives in terms of the carbon footprint is, is really horrible. So you, you, you guys should look this up online. So yes, if we can rally our communities to decrease leaf blowers, not only for the person that's you know, blowing the leaves, but also that the amount of diesel exhaust uh, it penetrates uh, the environment. So I uh, totally agree. I don't know of any Stanford policy for now, but I'm happy to work together to have Stanford be a leaf blower free community if someone's interested in helping. I believe there is going to be a uh, government, uh, there's government proposals to completely replace gas powered leaf blowers with electric. Uh, and I think within two years, and I can't remember wide a level, but uh, it's been proposed at least at the uh, Bay, whole Bay Area and maybe even at the state level. So oh, that's great. That's I believe it's at the state level that the, there's an initiative. So um, there's a question. Many of the older buildings in the Bay Area don't have air conditioning. Even new builds often don't include it. This makes it incredibly hot and uncomfortable when it's warm and windows need to remain closed due to poor air quality. Given that climate change and global warming aren't going away, what can be done to regulate retrofitting buildings and encouraging builders to include air conditioning? So this is an interesting question. Yeah, you know, this is on the side of, um, of uh, architects as well as builders. And uh, there was a meeting in San Jose recently as to how to conduct policy around this. And um, I think, you know, for us as healthcare workers, as well as for us as citizens, to be able to think about this more carefully, as well as to provide to our communities that don't necessarily have air conditioning, to have clean and to have cool rooms um, that they can go to. Uh, and of course, it's hard because during the time of COVID, people have to practice self-distancing. But I think for the communities, especially underserved and vulnerable, the state and the governor's office is thinking about putting these air conditioned units available, um, but I don't know exactly what each city is doing to provide um, information about this. So it's a great question. Um, and uh, there are some physicians, I believe, in medicine, in primary care, thinking about how to provide information to their families about this, but I'd be happy to um, 
think about this a little bit more because it, it's definitely affecting when we have wildfires where people can go to. Um, maybe we have, I think we're running a little late, but uh, just want, I just want to say that uh, David Axelrod uh, contributed that uh, there's a Newsom signed a no sale of any new gas powered leaf blowers, but it doesn't address the existing ones that are that can last for a long time. But I am aware there are initiatives to actually replace them. Uh, I believe uh, on the Stanford campus that there is an active interest in that. Good. That's great, um, thank you. All right, the very last question um, uh, from Wei Ting Chen. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Would love to hear more about your key takeaways from working with community members, leaders directly. How can we help more researchers and physician scientists engage the public? Uh, well, I have to say that it's one of the most satisfying parts of my job. I, I mean, I, I love doing what I do, but I think connecting with the community has given me such wonderful inspiration. And I didn't know it at the time. It takes a lot of work. You have to go there yourself. You have to find out who the local organizers are. I went out and visited the asthma coalitions straight away. I was a junior faculty member. I just made appointments. I just contacted them and made appointments, cold called. And then little by little, you start talking to them, asking them what they need, developing a rapport. That took time, five to 10 years. And luckily, I also collaborated with the University of California, Berkeley, who already had roots in the community. So I think to the extent that we can um, be advocates, engage the community, ask the community what they want, and then little by little, really try to help and then show them that um, what we're doing matters and then what they're doing matters. And so that has laid the groundwork for a lot of wonderful long-term studies. But I, I have to say that it's one of the, the greatest satisfactions. And, um, and I would, if people are interested, happy to talk offline. Well, uh, thank you, Kari, for a wonderful presentation and, and the uh, participation of the uh, attendees with questions and uh, safe travels uh, back to Europe and uh, uh, look forward to uh, working with you in the future on uh, many of these initiatives. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for everyone's attention. I also wanted to, because we also do food allergies, I wanted to show you this. This is part of your slide deck too, if you're interested, but I want to show you all the, trial, uh, the trials that we're doing for food allergy too. So if people are interested, um, then we're doing a pregnancy study and then we're doing a food equity initiative. So, so excited to be here today. And I really have, um, uh, thank you for all of your attentions and great questions. And thank you, Dave, for moderating. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.